Hello, sixth graders. So here we are at chapter four, um, one of the more exciting chapters in the book. I love this chapter. Um, so as before, all you need to do is open up your book and um, follow along with me. This chapter runs about 34 pages, and so let's get started. David had never seen a forest before. He had had a lift that morning and come a long way by car, and although he wanted to waste no time, he thought he, me he might spend an hour or two finding out what a forest looked like. He liked it at first, but after a while he began to feel uneasy. You could hide behind the tree trunks, and so could they. He realized well enough that they were not likely to wander about a forest just in case they might find someone. They always knew whom they were after, and even if they were looking for him, they would not be hiding in a forest on the off chance that he might pass by. Nevertheless, he felt more at ease when he was out in the open again. David preferred places where he could see what was coming far enough ahead for him to hide if he felt suspicious. He could not yet make up his mind whether they were really after him or not. If they were, it was not because he knew anything. Johannes had always said every time a new prisoner entered the camp, don't tell the boy anything. They may try to worm out of that they make to worm out of him afterward. Later on, when Johannes was dead, others had said the same thing, and the man had known that. But there was always the possibility that he was a useful hostage. Suppose, for example, he had had a father, and that father had been their enemy. Then they might have threatened him with the fact that they had David in their power. Not that David really believed it could be so. He could not imagine ever having had a father, but he had to reckon with the possibility that there was some reason that, that made it necessary for them to find him, and that was as near as he could get. He was suddenly aware of a strange sound. He looked quickly around and threw himself down behind a clump of bushes. There he was again, walking along and thinking without even looking where he was going. There was a house close by. He could see it among the trees, a large house and beautiful to look at, almost like a church. What was that sound? It was strange, strange, yes, and wonderful, too. When he was in Naples, he had seen a balloon. If you could turn into a balloon, that sound was what you might feel like, as if you had a great space inside you, and it was all filled with air, a heavenly air full of sweet voices that made you fly up and up, and your heart beat faster and faster, not because you were afraid, but because you were happy? Was that what happiness felt like? David knew he was listening to music. There had once been a musician in the camp, and before he had been there long enough to lapse into silence, he had talked about music and tried to explain what it sounded like, but David had not understood. He understood now, however, that he understood now, however, that sound that sound that seemed to flood right into your very being and draw you upward and upward. That was all the instruments playing together. And that thin, delicate sound that made your heart beat so fast, that must be the violin. One morning, by the side of a little stream, he found a red flower. A drop of water had fallen onto its red petal, and a ray of sunshine had caught it and made it tremble on the flower in David's hand and glisten with many colors. And David thought that if a ray of light from the sun could have made a drop of water speak, its voice would have been like the clearest notes of the violin. What the devil? You young thief forcing your way into people's grounds in broad daylight. I'll show you. You come here and I'll give you a good hiding. The voice fell like an explosion on David's ears. The wonderful sound of the music lay murdered, crushed, and kicked to death by an evil voice. He just managed to catch sight of a boy, a black-haired boy with spiteful, ill-natured eyes, before he was knocked down and trying to ward off the blows. It was impossible to get away, for the boy was as big as himself, and to escape would mean hitting back. David shielded his head against the boy's kicks and clenched teeth. The blows began to lose some of their force, and the boy seemed to hesitate. So you won't hit back, eh? Scared to fight, I suppose. David did not answer, and the boy said about him again, but less violently, violently this time, rather as if he felt he had to. Use your fist, you young swine! No. The boy appeared to have grown tired of striking him, at least for the moment, and David sat up with blood streaming from his nose. You seem to enjoy a good hiding. 
Maybe you like me for giving you one. The boy's voice was provocative. David regarded him calmly. No, I don't. I hate you. And I'd hate you just as much if it had been anyone else you'd hit. I wouldn't care if you fell dead right now. At least I'd be sure you'd never look at anything beautiful again. The strange boy looked astonished. Why don't you fight then? he asked crossly. Because if I hit you back, I'd be no better than you are. I'd be just as rotten and worthless, and I'd have no right to be free. The strange boy grinned at him, but there was a look of uncertainty about him, and his eyes shifted uneasily. You're not all there, he said. Who do you think you are talking to? I don't think I know. I'm talking to someone who likes to you likes using brute force, and that's why I don't want to talk to you anymore. You can hit me again if you can catch me. With that, David jumped up smartly and ran off. He could not run very quickly because he was beginning to ache all over where the bo other boy had struck him. But the strange boy did not follow him. He only shouted, Idiot! You're a crazy coward! David had the impression that he was shouting loudly for his own benefit. David was sick, and every time he thought about the young stranger, he felt like being sick again. He found it difficult to understand that people were well off here in Italy, where they had so much food to eat and were surrounded by such beauty of sea and countryside, could still love violence. That boy was just like the guards in the camp, the only difference being that the guards did not leave off striking till their victim lost consciousness. The boy, of course, had had only his bare hands to strike with and had tired of the effort too soon. For a moment, David was tempted to think that perhaps there were no good people at all outside concentration camps, but then he reminded himself of the sailor and Angelo and the English people who might have been ignorant but were certainly not bad. And then, when he was living among the rocks overhanging the sea, there had been the man with the lobes. He had not been bad either. He just had not been brave enough to let the boy go without giving him away, not for more than a few days at any rate. Yes, he felt there must be somewhere where everybody was kind and decent, a free country where people did not believe violence was a good thing, and he would find a free country if he could do it before he was caught again. But first of all, he must have a thorough wash. He thought from the lay of the land that there was probably a river nearby. There was, a large one too, although it was partly dried up as rivers usually were in the summer. In the summertime, David took his clothes off and put them in the water. He scrubbed himself thoroughly all over. His soap would soon be worn thin at that rate, but he did not care. He must not leave a spot unwashed where the boy had touched him. Not until all contact with him had been washed away would David be able to be free would David be able to feel free again? He washed his hair too, and then took his clothes out of the water and spread them to dry. He lay down beside them and made an effort to calm himself and forget the boy, much better to recall what the music had sounded like. Had there been a large orchestra inside that fine house, or had it been a radio? He was startled by the sound of voices not far away. He pulled his wet clothes toward him. A large boulder provided good cover on one side, and in front of him the trunk of an olive and, olive and rows of close-growing close vines, old and gnarled, completely hid him from view when he ducked down. It was some children playing, and David decided he would watch them. He usually hurried away when he saw children. He was afraid of them. He had never spoken to children, and he did not know how to begin. From the very first day... When he had made his home among the rocks, he had made up his mind to avoid children. They were much more dangerous than grown-ups, except them, of course. They were more dangerous because it was easier for them to see how different he was. Grown-ups could not really remember what children were like, so Johannes had once said, but other children would very soon discover that he knew nothing of the things they took for granted. One thing alone would give him away. He had no idea how to play. People were always talking about children playing, but playing seemed to mean so many different things that David had given up trying to find out what it was. There were so many more important things to learn about, and as long as he avoided children, there was no need for him to be able to play. But since he could not get away now until they left, he might just as well watch them. 
He parted the vines cautiously so that he could see. They were, there were two little boys, much smaller than himself, and a girl who was somewhat bigger, though still quite young, shouting and laughing and all three talking at once. They were running around a small building, not the sort of place people lived in, but where they kept tools and wheelbarrows and baskets for fruit picking. David could not take his eyes off the girl. She had black, curly hair, very long and tied with a red ribbon, and everything about her was beautiful. Not just her fine red dress, but everything. Her laughter sounded like the light of tinkling of polished glass, and when she moved, she reminded David of a flower swaying in the wind. They said they were going to play something called Davy Crockett in the Indians. First, the little boys were to be Indians. They would capture the girl, shut her up in the shed, and go off. Then, when they came back, they would pretend to be David Crockett, Davy Crockett and set her free. David thought it sounded silly, but that was probably because he did not really know what ordinary children were like. As far as he was concerned, he had no desire to be anyone but himself. He might feel differently about other things, like wanting to stay free long enough to find a country where he could live in safety, but he would always want to be David. That was why he had determined to go on living that morning he had come across his rock. As long as he had been a prisoner in the concentration camp, he had not cared what happened to him. He had followed others' examples, he had followed others' example and done as he was told. But that had not been living. But from the morning when he first fully realized he was an individual person called David, free and able to think for himself, everything had been different. No, David felt quite sure he would never pretend to be anyone else. The girl had gone into the shed now, and so there was nothing more to watch. He was very tired, too, and thought he might just as well take a nap before the little boys returned, and they all went off and left him free to go on his way. David was awakened by shouting and crying and a strange smell in the air. It's on fire! It's on fire! It's all your fault, Ketcha! You thought of it! You know very well we weren't allowed to play with fire. It was the two little boys, and it was the shed that was on fire. What shall we do? Run and get Carlo. Checha, oh, if only she doesn't get burned up while you're gone. Both the little boys were crying. One of them set off running in the direction David had come from. The other just stood there and wept. She was burning. The girl. It was the girl they were talking about now. The little girl who looked like a flower was inside that fire. David sprang up and took a step forward. Then he turned around and, grabbing his clothes, flung them into the river and jumped in after them. They were now sopping wet again. So many thoughts flashed through his mind as he ran that it seemed like hours to David before he reached the shed. A man in the camp had once escaped from a burning building by wrapping wet clothes around his head to keep the smoke out and prevent himself from losing consciousness, and he had not been burned about the face. If only he could get her out now. The shed wall was no longer burning so fiercely, but the door was a regular bonfire, and all those dry leaves and stalks the roof was made of, he would have to have her out before the fire got a proper hold on them. He was just going to call on God to help him when a thought occurred to him. God certainly would not want that little girl, so like a flower and so beautiful to look at, to die. Here, then, was something he could do for God in return. He could not say it out loud because he was running too hard, and so he said it to himself. God of green pastures and still waters, please don't help me. I want to do it by myself so that you'll know I've found something I can do for you. I am David. Amen. By that time, he had reached the burning shed. The little boy who had stayed behind was still crying, and David could hear the other voices down by the river, but he had no time to look around. With all the speed he could muster, he undid his bundle and took out his knife, picked up his wet clothes, and again with one hand held his trousers up in front of his nose and mouth. Then he sprang into the blazing fire. The flames had hardly reached the inside, but it was full of smoke. In the middle of the floor sat the little girl tied to an old chair. Tears were streaming down from her eyes, and between fits of coughing she was shouting hoarsely for help. David's first impulse was to run straight to her. Then he realized he must stop to consider what to do. 
He must think quickly, but as carefully as if he had all the time in the world. He must have time to cut through her bonds, yet the blaze from the door was now beginning to spread rapidly. The flames licking along the floor where dry leaves lay by the wall. There were no windows in the shed. They would have to, ha they would have to get out again through the bur burning doorway. Near it stood a pile of baskets and boxes, which David removed as far from the door as he could, leaving a train of three or four pieces of wood behind him. Then he seized a birch broom, already smoldering slightly, and swept all the dry, dry leaves away from the other walls toward the pile of baskets, so that, as he hoped, the fire would be encouraged to burn in that direction, instead of filling the whole room at once. In the meantime, he was coughing, too, for he could not hold his wet clothes up to his face and shift the baskets and sweep the floor at the same time. Next, he turned his attention to the girl. Shut your eyes, he said, and your mouth. He wound his wet shirt around her face, taking care that she could breathe freely inside. Then he started cutting through her bonds. Luckily, they were only a coarse, loose twine. If they had bound her to the chair, it would not have been so easy. But the knife was not very sharp, and he had to saw back and forth and forwards, saw backward and forward several times, and the little girl was beginning to wriggle her feet. David gripped them firmly to show her she must sit still. He dared not speak and risk getting more smoke inside his lungs. The heat was quite unbearable, but he was going to do it, and he was going to... He must! The cords were cut through at last. The little girl rose unsteadily to her feet and pulled the shirt from her face. Their eyes were hot and smarting, and they had to blink all the time. But David saw she was looking at him with such big black eyes. Then she shut them and stumbled and would have fallen if David had not taken hold of her. She had fainted. That meant she could not run out with him. He would have to carry her. For one moment, David felt he had he had promised God too much. He would not be able to do it. Perhaps she had died from the smoke. He laid her down on the floor and put his ear to her chest, as the men in the camp had always done, to see if one of their fellows was still alive. He could hear her heart beating. David wound his shirt about his head again and pulled his trousers down over his own. They were well worn, and so it was easy enough to stick his fingers through a hole and make it bigger. He would have to see where the door was. If he could not carry her through the fire, he would throw her clear. He would be able to manage that much before he succumbed to the flames. He was terrified of being burned to death, but perhaps it would be over quickly, almost as quickly as being shot. It would be better not to think about, think about it at the moment. He must concentrate on getting her up again and trying to run. She was heavy. It was a good thing she was not as big as himself, for if she had been, he could not have done it. For a split second, David hesitated in front of the raging, crackling fire that had been, been a door. Then he made straight for it, and then it was all over. He had gotten through, and he had the little girl with him. He could not remember afterward the order in which things happened. There were the two small boys outside, and several other people as well, two especially who were bigger. He was overcome with coughing and would certainly have fallen if he had not had the little girl to look after. The other shouted and wanted to take her, but he pushed them aside and, seating himself and the little girl on the ground, freed both their faces from his clothes. They were scarcely even damp now. Then he discovered that the little girl's hair had caught fire. One of her long curls had hung outside his shirt, so the fire thought it would cheat him of his prize. David failed to hear a car draw up, nor did he hear his own shout of anger. He cast his clothes aside, and seizing the little girl's hair with both hands, squeezed it tight, smothering the fire, not even aware that he was burning himself. The flames were nearly out, and he pressed her head against his chest to destroy the last sparks in case the fire should still be lurking there in the hopes that he would let it have her. Then he had another fit of coughing, and a daze wiped his eyes with his free hand. Then he looked down at the black, curly head again. No, the fire was all out now, and it had not touched the little girl, apart from her hair. She was on the point of coming around, as he could see from the slight flutter of her eyelids, but David continued to hold her, as if he were much too tired to think about setting her down. He just sat there, conscious, conscious only of the fact that he had beaten the fire 
and kept his promise. The little girl, who looked like a flower, was still alive. She opened her eyes, and they looked straight into David's wonderingly, not as if she were afraid, but as if she were now quite sure that everything was all right. Who are you? she asked. Not where you come from, or what are you called, or what do you want, the question people generally ask him, but who are you? I am David. Her lashes were enormously long. They shone black and lustrous as if the sun were shining on them, and the skin of her face looked as delicate as the petals of a flower. She was smiling now, only slightly, but enough to show a gleam of small white teeth between her red lips. David felt something happen inside him, as if he heard music, something wonderful, and something happened to his face, too, a movement that took him by surprise. David, repeated the little girl, not as if she had not heard him, but rather as if the sound of his name were something good to hold on to, and she did not stop smiling. Then David understood. He was smiling himself now. Yes, he said. One of those who were standing near them, and whom David had not noticed before, was drying his eyes, and it was not one of the little boys. It was a grown man, but it was a familiar voice that he finally heard, a voice that said, And I said you were a crazy coward. I've never before seen anyone do such a brave thing. Father, you didn't see what happened. The two little ones had tied her up, and he went right through the burning doorway and cut her free and carried her out again through the fire. Yes, I saw him coming out, Carlo. He saved Maria's life, and only just in the nick of time. Look, the roof's caught fire now. We would have been too late. Carlo, if he hadn't been here, Maria would have been lost. Even if I'd been here in plenty of time, I don't think I have dared, and I... Father, I chased him off this afternoon. The boys... The boys burned, Father. Look, his arms and legs are all black and he's got no clothes. It was one of the little boys who had at length stopped crying. David heard their voices far away. He could not bring himself to take his eyes off the little girl's face, for he knew it was she who had made him smile. And suppose his smile went when he stopped looking at her, and then he would never find out how one came to smile. One smiled for joy, of course, or was it happiness? Johannes had said there was a difference, Joy passed, but happiness never completely disappeared. A ch touch of it always remained to remind one it had been there. It was happiness that made one smile. Then, he would always remember that. So David sat there on the ground, burned and black with soot, stark naked but full of happiness and triumph, clinging to the prize he had cheated death of. He had done what he said he would do, he, David, had promised God he would give him the little girl, all by himself and without help, and he had done it, and God was clearly pleased with his gift. Had he not immediately shown him how to smile? And the little girl, who was so beautiful and soft to touch, she did not ask a lot of questions. She seemed quite satisfied that he was David. Yes, God obviously thought the gift was a good one. Shall I carry her for you, David? David looked up startled. The man, who was the children's father, was smiling at him. But he was not holding out his hand to take the little girl. He seemed to understand that she now belonged to David, who had rescued her from the fire, and he would not take her without permission. David noticed at once how painful his hands were and how dreadfully tired he was. Yes, please, he said. The little girl resisted slightly, and as soon as her father had lifted her up so that she could no longer see David, she called out, David! David began to get up, and the ill-natured boy, who was called Carlo, stepped toward him, as if to help him to his feet. He did not look ill-natured now, but David drew back from his touch and stood up by himself. You needn't be frightened, you know, Carlo said eagerly. I didn't know. You see, I think you're the bravest boy I've ever seen, and I'm terribly sorry. I, I gave you a beating. I'm sorry. I'm not frightened, said David curtly. Then he moved away to where the little girl could see him and said, I'll go with you to the car. The girl smiled again and held out her hand. David hesitated and then took it in his own. David's hand hurt him, 
David's hand hurts him, Maria said her father, but the little girl did not let go. She tightened her grip a little so that David had to go with her. Then she raised his hand and pressed it to her cheek. David, she said. David could feel him, feel himself smiling again, and he wondered whether smiling was something you could not help, something that happened as its own accord. When they had driven off, he would see if he could make himself smile by thinking of the way the little girl looked, as if she were a flower, as if she were pleased he was David. But they would not let him go. None of them would. Neither the two little boys who were carrying his clothes between them, nor the two big ones, Carlo and the other who was called Andrea. And their father said there could be no question about it. David must go home with them. David tried to explain that he had to be on his way, but when he held out his hand for his clothes, the two little ones started jumping around him, laughing and shouting, You can't have them! You can't have them! Not before you come home with us! The boy, who was called Andrea, laughed too, and slung David's bundle across his shoulder. David began to grow angry. They might be glad he, was res he had rescued the little girl from the fire, but that gave them no right to tell him what to do. Nobody had any right to do that. Then the children's father said, My name's Giovanni de Lavana del Varchi, and these are my children, Andrea and Carlo, the two little ones, Checha and Giulio, and of course Maria. We shan't keep you long if you must go on, but you mustn't deny me the pleasure of thanking you properly for what you've done. And what do you suppose Maria's mother would say if I let you go without giving her a chance to thank you for saving Maria's life? Unless we... No, David, you mustn't ask me to do that. David's anger vanished. They did not want to tell him what to do. They were only asking him to do something for them, to give them pleasure. He could not spoil their pleasure. The man with the long name was smiling at him, but David could not manage to smile back. He could do it only when he was looking at the little girl. So instead, he said earnestly, I won't ask you to do anything, and of course I'll do as you wish, senor. He put out his hand for his clothes again, and this time the boys gave them to him. But their father said hastily, No, boys, let David have the traveling rug from the back seat to wrap himself in. It's softer and won't irritate his burns so much. David looked at the beautiful rug anxiously. It was a check pattern in many different colors. But I'm black from the fire, senor. I shall make it dirty. The children all cried out that it did not matter in the least, and so David was wrapped carefully in the traveling rug and helped onto the front seat next to Maria, who snuggled up to him, although it was a wide seat with plenty of room on it. Luckily, he had hit upon a new name for the place where the circus was supposed to be, for the boys inundated him with questions until their father told them to leave David in peace. They drove through a tall gateway and found themselves in a garden so big that it seemed to have no end, and the house where the children lived was the same magnificent house that David had seen earlier that afternoon. David thought as quick as lightning that a house was dangerous, but then they were glad he had rescued the girl. As long as they did not discover where he came from, they certainly would not wish him any harm, and it would be an enormous advantage to find out what a house was like inside. Nevertheless, as David walked up the broad flight of steps in his bare feet and stepped over the threshold with its magnificently carved door, he felt a vague disquiet. What would happen there? Nothing to harm him, but something all the same. Something different from what he was used to, something he had not expected or even knew existed. David could not explain why he felt ill at ease and thrust the thought inside, or thrust the thought aside. He had done it now. He had entered a house. He was confused by so many impressions that he could not grasp anything properly at first. The house was full of things, and there were women in black dresses and white aprons who must be maids, and there was a very beautiful woman who turned out to be the children's mother, and she laughed and cried almost in the same breath, and it was very difficult to escape her caresses. And then they phoned a doctor, and David said he would like to wash, but they would not let him, not before the doctor had been there, they said, for he must not get water on his burns, and it was no use David saying he did not think he was very badly burned. Then the doctor came and said David was right. 
Maria had come to no harm at all because David had carried her so quickly through the fire. David could thank the thick soles of his feet, he said, that he had gotten off so lightly from his act of heroism. He was a little burned about the hands and arms and legs, but it would not be long before he recovered. David knew that doctors were good men. They were never allowed inside the camp, and the other prisoners had always told him that doctors were there to help people when they were ill. So he submitted quietly while the doctor touched him and wiped the dirt away with something from a bottle. It hurt all the time. And then the doctor put something else on his burns, and that hurt too. But the doctor explained that if he did not do it, the burns would be more painful the next day. David must just go to sleep now, and then he would feel better when he woke up again. The doctor was right too. David did feel better. He felt fine, in fact, although his hands were still rather painful. He opened his eyes and remembered that he was lying in a bed. He shifted his position slightly, but the bed still felt cozy and wonderfully soft. He sat up to see what it was like, and the bed gave under his weight and bounced gently under him. So that was what a bed was, a big box on legs made of dark polished wood with, with pillows and sheets. Yes, it was going to be most interesting to see what a house looked like, and he thought of all the words he would now be able to use. He knew many words he had never used because he was afraid that, not knowing the things they referred to, he might use them wrongly and show his ignorance. Besides, he would have felt silly saying words without really knowing what they meant. Sheets. Imagine sleeping every night in a soft bed like that, where you did not feel cold, and between soft white sheets, where you knew everything around you was perfectly clean. He continued gazing at the sheets for a while longer. He was itching with impatience to examine the room and everything in it. But there was something he had to attend to first. He had learned what happiness meant, and he had found out how to smile, without even practicing in a mirror. That was a very important thing, much more important than the bed, for he could not take that with him, but the other, that would stay with him wherever he went. Johannes had taught him always to remember to say thank you. He had meant to people, of course, and he had been very strict about it. He had missed... He had insisted upon David saying thank you, even to them. When they gave him food, for example... But David had not wanted to, not to them. But Johannes had said, politeness is something you owe other people, because when you show a little courtesy, everything becomes easier and better. But first and foremost, it's something you owe yourself. You are David, and if you never allow other people to influence what you're really like, then you've something no one can take from you, not even they. Never mind what others are like. You must still be David. Do you understand what I mean? David had not said yes right away, for Johannes would always have him think carefully first and not answer until he understood what he was saying. But afterward David had realized something of what Johannes had meant, especially when a short time later there appeared in the camp an inspector who thought David might know something about Johannes. The boy knows nothing, the man had said, and he had been right, of course, but if he had known anything they wanted to find out, he would still have done his best to say nothing, even if they had offered him extra food to talk, and even though Johannes would never have scolded him for doing it, he would have tried to keep silent, not because of anything other people might say or do, but simply because he was David and Johannes's friend. After that, he had always said thank you when he was given food, not to make them think he did not hate them, but so that they could see he was polite because he wanted to be. And if you wanted to be polite to people, even to them, then you must also remember to be polite to God. It would not take more than a minute, and he could examine the room afterward. David stared hard at the sheet so that nothing in the room should distract his attention, and then said quickly, God of the green pastures and the still waters, I want to thank you, because I've learned about happiness and found out how to smile, and thank you, too, for being pleased I rescued the girl for you. I hope I can find something different to do for you next time, because that was very difficult, and I was very frightened of the fire, and so I would rather not do anything like that too often. Will you please let it do for the next three times? I may need you to help me. 
I am David. Amen. As soon as he had said amen, he was out of bed. On the floor was a large patterned carpet, soft and cozy to walk on, chairs and a table, those he recognized, of course, but he had never seen such magnificent ones, and a large wardrobe and a piece of furniture with drawers in it. It was not a writing table, a chest of drawers, perhaps, and everything was elaborately carved in designs of leaves and fruits and animals' heads. The window was wide and tall, and on both sides of it hung curtains of some thick, soft, thick material dyed the same color as the leaves of an olive tree. David moved noiselessly about the room, examining everything closely, touching and returning to look again. There was a bowl on the table and two tall, slender objects that he pondered over deeply till he came to the conclusion that they must be candlesticks. They were shiny. Silver? Yes, they must be silver. David repeated the word slowly to himself, enjoying the sound of it. Silver was something very rich and fine. They looked like silver, at least, from what David had heard about it. He, His glance traveled upward. There was a picture, not the sort you saw pasted on the outside walls of shops and houses, but one that showed a beautiful scene. David stood on the bed and stretched up to see it better. It was a painting. He was sure of it. It was just like what the men in the camp had described to him. David sat down in bed, quite overcome. If only he could remember it all. He had been so small when he had any knowledge of what the world was like outside the concentration camp, and Johannes had not liked the men to tell him too much about it. What the boy doesn't know, he won't miss, he would say. David had once heard him say that when they thought he had fallen asleep. They had always answered his questions, but they would leave it at that, and afterward, when Johannes was dead, he had spoken to no one. He was lucky, therefore, to have learned at least something, and now it was up to him to remember all he could and keep his eyes open so that the children and their parents would not discover how little he really did know. He wondered whether he should stay where he was until someone came and said he might go downstairs, or should he just get up and go down? But his clothes were not there, and he could not walk about the house with nothing on. Before he had time to consider further, the door opened gently and the children's mother peeped in. So you're awake, she said, smiling. I have brought you some clothes in case you want to get up. You may stay in bed if you'd rather. Are your hands still painful and your ankles? Are they any worse? David answered that his ankles hurt most, but he was not in great pain anywhere and would like to get up. But they're not my clothes, he said, as he saw that what the children's mother was laying across the chair. No, they're being washed. These are Andre's, but I think they'll fit you. David looked at them anxiously. I may tear them on a branch, he said. My dear boy, and after all you've done for us. David wondered if he should explain that he had not rescued the little girl on their account, but entirely for his own sake in order to repay his debt to God. He decided not to, however, Perhaps she would not understand, and perhaps she did not know about his God of the green pastures and still waters. It was safer not to say too much, for then he would avoid saying anything that might rouse their suspicions of him. He put the clothes on, or rather the children's mother helped him to, for they were very fine clothes with buttons and a thing called a zipper, which David had not was not at all sure how to manage. There were trousers, short brown ones like those the children had been wearing, and a shirt, not one like his own, but a real shirt with buttons. It was green. There were stockings, too, and the kind of shoes they called sandals. David had never, never tried wearing anything on his feet before, and there were pockets in the trousers. David stood quite still, and his eyes began to feel hot, as if he wanted to cry. He had never thought he would wear clothes like these, and he had an irrepressible desire to see what he looked like, to see whether he looked like an ordinary boy at last. The lady seemed to guess what was passing through his mind, for she opened the wardrobe door, and there on the inside was a large, full-length mirror. It was big enough for a boy to see himself from to top to toe, or for a grown man come to that. David regarded himself critically, he did not think there was anything odd about what he saw. 
True, he did not have black hair, but otherwise he looked like any other boy who was not particularly fat, and he had grown quite brown from being in the sun so much. Without thinking, he said, I look quite like an ordinary boy now, don't I? Of course you do, she answered, but she did not sound as if she altogether meant it. Then she added, and you look very, and you look a very handsome boy, and a brave one too. Come, the children are impatient to see you, and you must be hungry. She walked so quickly that David could not see anything properly. He was aware that there was furniture everywhere, and carpets and paintings, but he had no opportunity to see what they looked like. They descended a long, broad staircase and came to, a net, to other rooms. One of them had a door that led out to the large garden, and there they found the children and their father. Maria was looking rather pale, but her father said she had insisted upon getting up and coming downstairs so that she could see David again. David found himself smiling once more as he looked at her. Drink your milk now, children, and then you can take David out to play, but not too roughly, mind. You must be careful of his burns. They said he should stay with them for a while, at any rate until his arms and legs were quite well again, and he was welcome to stay even longer if he were not expected back with the circus immediately. David did not really know what he would rather do. He wanted to go, but at the same time he wanted to stay in order to learn all he could about the house. He looked up intently at the children's father and mother. They were both smiling. Can I go now, this very moment, if I want to? The children's father stopped smiling and looked disappointed. Yes, of course, David, if that's what you'd rather do. But we should all be very glad if you would stay with us for a while so that we could show you how grateful we are. David considered. If only it were not too dangerous, he would like to stay with them a little and learn more about their way of life. If I can go whenever I want to, then I'd like to stay for a bit, he said at length. Yes, thank you. I don't have to join the circus just yet. But please, don't be so grateful, for you see, I wanted to rescue the little girl from the fire, and you've already thanked me. Yes, but we shall continue to be grateful to you as long as we live, David. It's, so it's something we shall never forget, the children's father said quietly. David felt very, very tired that evening. He was to sleep once more in that soft, cozy bed, and yet it was a long time before he fell asleep. So excited was he with all he had seen that day. He could not remember even half of it. There was not, there was not room in his head for so many new impressions at once. But he did remember the food. Never would he forget what it was like to eat in such a house. It was almost like listening to music. Johannes had once told him about it, and when he saw it, he remembered. One of the prisoners had made some remark about eating like pigs, and so David had asked people whether people ate differently outside the camp. But he had never been able to picture what it was like, and now he had seen for himself. You sat at a table covered with a cloth so white that it gleamed, and there were plates, one for each person, with flowers painted on them, and candlesticks with candles in them, and flowers in a bowl, and the glasses you drank from were fine and delicate, and tinkled if you happened to touch them with a knife or fork and the knives and forks and spoons were all of silver, and everyone laid his own, as well as a napkin to wipe his fingers on should they become greasy. David was afraid he would not know how to eat properly, but he watched the children's father and mother first, and then did as they did. It was lucky he was used to being careful in his movements, for otherwise he would certainly have spilled something, and there was more food than you could possibly eat at one time all kinds of different things, and everything tasted wonderful. David dared not eat very, eat very much, for he knew the rich food might make him ill since he was not used to it. But to think of eating it something, as something beautiful, well, if that was how the prisoners in the concentration camp had been in the habit of eating, he could well understand why they said they ate like pigs there. The food was brought in by the servants and cleared away before the next course arrived, and you were given clean plates and knives and everything, and the children said they ate like that every day and several times a day. The next day he would enjoy it all again. So that's the end of chapter 4. Chapter 5, David continues with the family. We'll read that next. Thank you.